Yo, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to Six Man Blitz. I'm Jake Lynch. The Oklahoma City Thunder have 17 first round picks for the next seven years. Why should I not even get a top three pick? The draft is so hit or miss. But I'm Micah Huff. Draymond Green said he's the best defensive player of all time. He's not even the best player on his own team. Clay Thompson can be locking up. And even in the whole league, Rudy Gobert. He shut down the whole league before. Oh, he's the best defensive player in the league. Hey, they only say that because Draymond is like he's six nine, so he can guard the one, two, the three, or the five. That's the only reason. And Tony right. Allen. It's crazy. It's crazy to think about. What's the last time you heard about Draymond Green before that? Before what he just said. <laughs> what has that man been doing? <laughs> he does not have Twitter fingers. You do not know this man. Nah. <laughs> We need but, Conor McGregor to get back on his ass. <laughs> <laughs> Conor McGregor, he was talking stuff about Floyd Mayweather, Draymond coming. Hey, don't wear that jersey, man. Like, come, like Draymond, what are you doing, man? <laughs> but we got a great show for you guys today. I've got an interview with brother of the program, uh, Jacob Huff, former Minnesota Gopher safety. Uh, we went from him growing up in Bolingbrook to him going to Minnesota. How was it playing with his twin brother and brothers um, to him? finishing his gopher career at pj flick so i think it's a great show um make sure to subscribe and download our episodes on apple Podcasts, spotify youtube make, make sure to hit keep hitting that subscribe button on youtube uh we're over 80 subscribers now something like that so, so we're, we're getting up there trying to get to 100 we'll see what happens to get to 100 we'll We'll see. We just did a giveaway, so I don't know if we're going to Shout out to LJ Brockington for winning the giveaway. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a little it's a little rigged. LJ Brockington went win the, win the, win the, win the He won know. second place, too, though. <laughs> <laughs> you don't even get the jersey, but... Uh, <laughs> yeah, so we got a great show for you guys today. Uh, make sure to keep keep supporting us. Make sure to keep following us on social media. Uh, Six Minute Blitz, uh, Apple, uh, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok. Make sure to keep up with that. We're going to be posting more on all those accounts. Uh, we've been slacking a little, but we're going to get back, you know. But uh, keep supporting us, and we appreciate you guys' support. You got anything else? Nah, you covered it all. <laughs> hey, now let's get into this interview. Touchdown oh, Bears! No way! And fires! Yes! The Bulls lead 87-86. Hello? You play to win the game. Let's go to eat a damn snack. All right, now let's welcome our former Minnesota DB and brother of the program, Jacob Huff. How you feeling today, man? I'm good, man. Thanks for having me. I feel uh, honored to, uh, you know, be able to be a guest on this show. Um, you know, whenever you uh, washed up old player like me and ever get asked to hear how I was in the past, it's always exciting, so thanks for having me. No, nah, yeah, we. I mean, we always we always go have you on for a while now, so it's finally good to have you on. It's mm -hmm. a tough selection yeah. process to get on this show, man. <laughs> That's what I hear. I've been I've been inquiring <laughs> about it. You know, talking to Mike here and there. I thought it was never gonna happen, but hey, hey he's like, when are you gonna put me on the show? <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> <laughs> All right, so now let's start the interview off. Um, so you played multiple sports growing up. You were always active. How, like, when did you know football was your sport? Well, I would say it was around the time when I got to this, my sophomore season of high school. Because um, before then, I was a baseball guy. I loved baseball. It was my first love. Uh, my parents, um, they loved watching me play baseball. It was my best sport. Um, so I was all baseball going into high school, but – it got to a point where I loved football, but um, I really saw myself uh, kind of developing more in the sport um, and reaching a higher potential in football after my freshman season. Um, and then it got to a point where in, I was going into my sophomore season and you know I had about five or six seniors ahead of me in my position. And my defensive back coach, Todd Howard, basically broke it down to me and said, hey, we're going to pick the younger guy if we see the same skill level, if we see the same, you know, experience. If we see the same talent, we're going to pick the younger guy just because we got more years with him. So I, so I knew I had an opportunity going into that season, and uh, I was able to beat out all of those 
uh, seniors that thought they were just, you know, a shoe in and never thought a sophomore could beat them out in, in a job. But um, I was able to do that. So that was pretty cool. And once I did that, I kind of just ran with it. I had a pretty solid sophomore season. And then I was feeling, you know, this is actually something that um, maybe I can go to college for. Maybe I can get a scholarship for. And then obviously uh, my next couple of seasons were pretty solid as well to where I was able to reach those goals. Yeah, because playing football, I mean, obviously more entertaining than playing baseball. So I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't say that 100%, but um, we're football guys, so we're going to say that through and through. Uh, but, you know, there's baseball guys out there. I still love watching baseball. I think it's still a fun sport to, to play. But, yeah, we're football guys, so hey. Yeah, exactly. Now, a lot of people seem to think that playing O-line builds character. And when you start off at Pop Warner, all of the best players are always playing O-line behind the coach's kids and stuff. So you started off playing Pop Warner, and uh, for the Patriots, you played center. Did you ever think you'd be able to, like, play safety at the level you played in high school? No. Nah, so that's a good question. No, not at all. I mean, it's kind of a crazy story. Actually, when I was playing center – first couple seasons, you know, with Patriots. Patriots, by the way, is the youth organization um, that, you know, we were fairly good. We went to, you know, pretty uh, – we went to a lot of the, um, you know, Florida trips and a lot of the, you know, Pop Warner championship trips. But anyways, uh, I was the center of that, that, uh, that team, and it's kind of crazy thinking back on it how that was the best position for me to play – the, in the coach's eyes, and uh, I just wanted to play the game. Obviously, I wanted to be in a skill position like most kids do, but I was one of the smaller kids that um, that was in that position, and, uh, you know, I was tough. I was really tough, so they could, they could work with me there, but I was, um, you know, taking a beating a lot of times. Uh, and it is a funny story, actually, that the coach, my mom, you know, our mom, <laughs> actually put – uh, you know, talked to the coach and was like, you need to try him out a different position just for a couple plays. You know, he was she was bugging him about it because I was bugging about it because I was I wanted to play, you know, a different position. I wanted to play quarterback, but they were like, okay, well, we'll throw you in at, at uh, safety. So they throw me back there at safety and I'm out there for one play and I ended up, you know, covering a guy. They didn't throw him the ball, but it was fine. Everything was cool. The next play, um, the next play, the slot receiver just goes straight fly route on me. And um, he, he toasted me to a crisp and they threw the ball and it was like 80 yard touchdown. And that's a, that's a big, that's a big deal. And, you know, when you're 11 year old, years old in a youth program. <laughs> so, um, you know, I get to the sideline and these coaches are like, oh, shit, why do we do that? And then I hear one of my teammates who, you know, it actually crazy. He just actually just got out of jail. So now you see the correlation <laughs> between this. But uh, he, uh, um, he basically whispers to another guy that I actually heard. And uh, he's like, why do we have a safety? Why do we have a center playing safety? <laughs> right after I just got my, uh, my, to my butt toasted on this play. Um, so it didn't make me feel good. I, I mean, I, 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 going back after that, um, you know, had my head down. Obviously, didn't after feeling that didn't even want to play anymore. Let alone, you know, play safety. Didn't want to play center. Uh, but you know, moving forward from that, you know, looking back on that, that helped develop me as a person and as a football player. And that's one key that you point at towards really any kid that's thinking about playing youth sports is you know, football really develops character. Um, and I think it did a lot for me because going into that high school, uh, the high school sphere. I wasn't going to let anybody really beat me out of the position. Um, I've, you know, kind of been at the worst points in the position, you know, necessarily, uh, give or take. And I, you know, kind of just saw myself fighting my way through it. Um, and it all worked out. Yeah, so you talk well, about your, yourself uh, in sophomore year of high school battling through positions. Was there any pressure uh, going to varsity as a sophomore, especially with your older brother, already established himself on the team and then when it fresh uh stayed as a freshman for you I think Jay I think Jaden added pressure to me and Julian because it was like 
you know, okay, Jaden's good. We see that Jaden's good. Is is or are the twins going to be good? And um, well, I mean. Right when we first got to high school, they were really kind of just looking at us and making sure, hey, giving us the eye test and making sure we're going to kind of fill out, you know, what we're supposed to look like. Hopefully we get my our dad's height or hopefully we're just a little bit taller than Jaden or something like that. Uh, but, yeah, I think Jaden kind of added the pressure a little bit because if Jaden wasn't very good, uh, we would just be another set of twins coming into high school that nobody was really waiting for. But uh, – that that does go into it. Where Jaden where Jaden was good, Ivalo and the rest of the coaching staff were waiting for guys like me and Julian um, once we got done with middle school to come in and you know help out the program. So originally they put us on the sophomore team, and um, you know they saw that we had potential. They saw we we were pretty solid players. Then we ended up going to um, the following year being a sophomore walking into the varsity realm and now it's like whoa um so it was a lot of pressure on, on us but you know you know pr my dad always says pressure either busts pipes or makes diamonds so we ended up uh we ended up doing well so so you talk about going into your sophomore year now you were on the team with two of your other brothers and how was that how was that experience th like playing with two brothers like a lot, a lot of people don't even play with one. <laughs> well, you should know, man. You were on. You were the ball boy on the sideline. <laughs> Halftime games went crazy. <laughs> nah, it was cool. I mean, it was really cool when we uh, got the picture and you know got the whole season when Jaden was number one, I was number two, and Julian was number three. You know, not a lot of brothers get to experience something like that on a really, really good football team. You know, uh, we were kind of the you know, we, I mean, walking through the halls, you know, was, we were the football guys, you know, we're the, we're the Huff brothers type of thing. We had a, we had kind of an image, um, nothing that was, you know, too egotistical at all, but it was just like, we're the, we're the football guys. And having that title, having that image was kind of fun. I mean, and then scholarships starting to roll in and things got even more fun. We were playing well our, my junior year. I think we were undefeated my junior year. Um, and yeah, everything, everything really seemed like it was going according to plan. And not a lot of people get to experience that with their brothers, you know. I mean, me, Jaden, and Julian having that um, camaraderie on the field together, uh, yin, yang, and bang, um, that's kind of how it felt. Now, you talk about that the scholarship started rolling in. What ultimately led you to decide to go to Minnesota over other schools? That's a good question. I, <laughs> I visited Nebraska. Uh, Nebraska, by the way, never offered me. Um, the school I really wanted to go to, if they offered, I would have been there without a doubt. It was Penn State. I loved uh, Penn State, wanted to go there. My favorite color growing up was navy blue. So just seeing, you know, the whole, you know, sphere of uh, the Happy Valley and, you know, the, you know, whiteouts. I, I wanted I wanted to be part of that. But I like to think that the fact that um, I got to play against them, Got to play against Saquon, Trace McSorley, and all, all the boys that year. The one that they the year they actually won the Big Ten was uh, you know, kind of fulfilling fulfilling that dream of playing with them rather than or playing against them rather than playing with them. I think it fulfilled that dream. But um, once I visited Minnesota, it was more so I, if it checked all the boxes. Like I wasn't really trying to go somewhere south. I think that would have been cool. I mean, all the, you know. Football, really, football teams are in the South is what some people think. But there's a lot of good football that's obviously played in the North and the Midwest and the Big Ten. I think the Big Ten's the best conference, I mean, uh, after playing in it. So, um, I, I mean, like I said, it checked all the boxes. When I first got to campus, I loved Coach Kill. I loved his, his atmosphere, his culture that he created, his vibe. I love the way he let his coaches run things. Um you know, and they, they've, it felt like they wanted us. So that was really huge for us as well. Um, and I like where when I got on campus, the campus, um, 
It's beautiful, especially in the summer. The winter, it's like it's you know, it gets cold. But like, I wasn't trying to go south. I'm from the Midwest. I was fine playing in the Midwest. So um, that was you know, really getting that first visit really just checked all the boxes for me, and um, it seemed like a place with a lot of potential that could that haven't been good in the past, but we can we can make good. Well, it wasn't hard now like having a twin brother, but one school would want the one brother, another school would want another brother. Was it hard really trying to pick a school that wanted both of you guys at the same time? Well, it wasn't hard for me. <laughs> it turned the phone off during the interview. <laughs> That's actually Julian calling me. Uh, it wasn't hard for me because most of the schools wanted me more than Julian. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but like for example, Michigan State wanted Julian more than me. Um, Minnesota wanted me more than Julian. I think Nebraska wanted the both of us equally. Um, it's just that recruiting process, man. It's it's like you can't take anything personal, even though guys uh, regularly do. Um, and it's you know <laughs> it's natural, it's human nature to take it personal, but. It's a business, and you got. And they treat you like you're an employee as soon as you get to campus. They treat. They, I mean, they give you this lovey-dovey speech if they like you. They, you know, they want you to come to campus. They want you to commit. They think you're gonna, you're the best stuffs and sliced bread. But at the end of the day, it's a business. You'll see that attitude will change very quickly as soon as you get to campus, whether you're good or not. If you're if you're good and you start performing, then they, you know. Then they start to give you a little bit, you know, more trust and leeway to do things. But if uh, – and total opposite, if you don't do anything, you know, if you're, they're spending money on you on a scholarship and you're just a guy that's hanging around that's not doing anything, um, they're going to find a way to get you out of there. If not, you know, force you out. So um, it's a business. And like I said, if a guy wants Julian more than me, then that's just how it is. You can't take it personal. It's the same thing, vice versa. So now your first your first year on campus, you see you see your brother Julian starting to get some playing time, getting some, you know, he's shining in the moment. How was that having him go off, but you're in the back burner, you know, just like Yeah, oh yeah. So like I said, I mean everybody wanted it was kind of funny because some of the fans actually said this right when Julian started playing well and started getting sacks and whatnot. They were like, didn't didn't we want the other brother more? Uh, but now he's sitting on the bench and Julian's, you know, the actual one who's good. <laughs> and uh, that's how I felt, to be honest. I mean, that I took personal. That I was like, wow, this is tough to, you know. I was very happy for Julian, very happy. But it was hard just to be a freshman, you know, and watch your twin actually, um, you know, do the things he was doing, getting that kind of Big Ten recognition, national recognition, you know, being able to, uh, you know, be on the leaderboards on the team and stuff like that. It was it was really cool for him to do that. But obviously, like I said, human nature, I wanted to do that as well. Um, but I'm sure he felt similar when when the when the uh, when the tide turned and the roles were reversed. So. That man was reading the articles like the Jordan memes, taking that personal when he's started reading those articles. <laughs> yeah, a little like, bit. Them fans be treating like the players the worst, and they be the fans of the team. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And they be your fans biggest critic. And I don't blame them. I mean, it's it's the nature <laughs> of the game, you know. But, you know, they, it does get personal. It's an emotional <laughs> game. Of course it's going to get personal. All right, now, so you talk about uh, kill – how was the transition from kill to fleck? Uh, it was not an easy one. No transition from any staff. Ask any college football player if they enjoyed a transition from one coach to the next. Unless, unless of course, they wanted this coach or the coach knew him before and they treated him very well. But m most generally, people understand that Coaching changes are never fun. I mean, when I when I say we went through absolute hell with the uh, flex staff in a good way, I think I think the flex staff when they first came in, um, they put us through absolute hell. Like I can imagine being, you know, no, it's not as extreme, but imagine being in Navy SEALs and you know just day in and day out, 
uh, you're just absolutely miserable. <laughs> That's what it felt like. <laughs> uh, and it, it, they were really trying to weed guys out. That's what they wanted to do. I mean, that's their job. They, the guys who did not want to be there, they try to figure out a way to get them out. And the way they did that was, uh, you know, 5 a.m., killer workouts, you know, guy messes up, guy's even a second late to tutoring session, everybody on the team's running. Um, and it's, you know, the worst part about it was um, going into spring ball, only having about five DBs, six DBs total. And when you're one of two safeties and you got three teams going, you're running – two safeties it's just you and another guy and you have to stay out there because there's nobody else to replace you and it wasn't the workouts it wasn't the um, 6 a.m training sessions it wasn't the tutors it was none of that it was spring ball having only one other guy on your sideline that you had to go out there with it was absolutely exhausting and uh, i wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy <laughs> now pj fleck coming in you know, this, he's a character. He's got a lot of energy. He's got all these catchphrases. He's just saying all these different things that motivate you. Yeah. Now, do you have a PJ Flex story that stands out to you? Oh, man. Uh, PJ Flex story. Um, it's, uh, it, it's a really good story from my end um, because uh, when I've – this is kind of transitioning into the, the – the story of how Julian was kind of the guy. Um, and I was just special teams guy. I was just on sidelines during defense and I was just out there for special teams. Wasn't doing much. When Julian got injured and the coaching staff changed, Julian kind of was seen as the um, the injured guy because he was come recovering from injury and things like that. And uh, uh, the coaches more or less didn't think he could play just because he was injured. And when he was out there, you, you know, he was kind of limping around. He'll be the one, he'll be the first one to tell you. And I'll be the first one to tell him that when it was happening, hey, you need to get some recovery. <laughs> because, uh, <laughs> and it's all about impressions too, because when the new coaching staff comes in, they want to know if you can play. So that really didn't help Julian's case. And it also doesn't help that Julian actually had two – uh, two draft picks in front of him that were starting in front of him. So uh, none of that helped him. But going into my story, I mean, what was bad for him was great for me. I had a whole new fresh start with a whole new coaching staff. I loved Kill to death. I loved him to death. But the um, position coach, uh, I felt like sometimes maybe I didn't get the benefit of the doubt. But it was, ab it was absolutely no fault of his. Uh, I think that I put myself in certain positions that didn't allow me to play, which, like I said, I'm not, I would never blame him for that. But um, in certain cases, I felt like maybe I could have gotten more opportunities to, to play. Um, but like I said, it's, it's a, it's a business. You can't, you can't complain about any of that. So going into that new staff, I got a new, um, oh, I got a fresh, fresh slate, clean slate. And I was able to kind of put out my best foot, forward and um, I ended up getting like seven or eight interceptions within the first week and a half of uh, spring ball and I was really I was really playing the position really well I looked like a guy that they can actually trust out there and then the rest of the spring ball I was playing really really well um, and then going into fall camp going into fall camp and you know most people know a lot about fall camp. Mikey, you're going to – you guys are going to find out pretty soon how crappy it is in college. But, um, yeah, I mean, it, it was the same story. I was playing really well. I was doing really well. And Coach Fleck, every time I got an interception, Coach Fleck would say, I love Huff. <laughs> and it would happen pretty often because I knew uh, the concepts, I knew the offensive schemes sometimes better than the – person running the offensive scheme, the receivers or the quarterback, because I would just watch a ton of film. So um, I put myself in a really good position to make a lot of interceptions. So uh, Coach Fleck would say, I love Huff a lot. <laughs> and so one practice after film uh, or one practice, 
I had a really good day. And then the, the following practice, we had film in the morning. We had a team meeting after film. And he was playing. He usually did this. He played some clips of, you know, kind of the highlights of the previous practice or something to give guys their, you know, give guys their cookies or whatever. And um, he played you know, one of my clips and then he played another one. And he was like, this is how you do that. Uh, and then, <laughs> then he pulls out a shirt. He pulls out a shirt and it said, I love Huff on it. <laughs> and he was like, I told you I was going to get you a shirt. And he throws me a shirt in the, in the stand in, 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 where I'm sitting in the first row. And uh, everybody in the audience was like, yeah, that's cool. But what about Julian? I mean, it's just like, I love Huff. And it was kind of a funny story because, you know, um, like a lot of, a lot of the guys were like, Julian's right fucking here. <laughs> and he deserves a shirt too, even though Julian uh, was still kind of injured and still coming back and covering and stuff. But um, he ended up getting Julian a shirt as well. Um, I don't know what happened to that shirt, but um, that's that's my highlighted story of Flack. There's there's a million other, but I can't really go into more depth of that. <laughs> Now, like, you had talked about putting your best foot forward. Junior year, you had a big year. You had 65 tackles, three interceptions. Now, was it hard seeing your brother go through what he was going through, even though it happened, you know, vice versa? But were you a little more supportive because you were in the same position? In the uh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I definitely was more supportive than he was of me. Yeah. <laughs> 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 um, because I've been there, you know, I was there not too long ago. So I was like, okay, well, I guess it's my turn. That's just, that's basically how I felt. I guess it's my turn, you know, to kind of do some of this. Because if I would have went through all of college not playing, you know, it would have been very, it would have been bad. You know, and from my opinion, you know, I think I went into college wanting to represent my family, represent me well. And I would have been disappointed if I didn't get an opportunity to play. So I ended up getting my opportunity and I started playing. It was just very unfortunate that, uh, you know, the, the, what, the, what the gears that caused me to walk into that new position actually walked Julian out of the position. So uh, that's kind of what it felt like. Um, and I was there for him, you know, I would talk to him. But <laughs> sometimes, so we'd talk after some games, he, you know, feel like <laughs> some games he didn't feel like going out for kickoff and shit. Um, <laughs> but it ended up being all right. You know, I um, had to talk him through some things. And I felt the same the first first two years. So uh, it all I, I feel like it all worked out. And, I mean, I'm sure this is a question that's about to come up. But um, that last game that we had, that last two games that we had, first Wisconsin and Georgia Tech, it finally felt like me and Julian, even though we had a separate uh, career, uh, you know, separate career highlights, um, it, it kind of melded together towards the last two games. And that's really what we look, we both look back to um, and what exactly, uh, what exactly we can close the books on the season or our careers with. Yeah, we were just about to ask you about that Wisconsin game. How was it being part of one of the biggest upsets in Minnesota football history? That that was awesome. I mean, it was the best. Um, you know, I mean, even think about it right now. It was the best time of my life. I mean, we uh, we walked into that game, and probably half the people on the team didn't feel, didn't even think we were going to win. I know half the players that didn't travel, or I know all the players that didn't travel knew we were going to lose. Uh, and half a minute, I would say 95% of Minnesotans thought we were going to lose. So, um, and then you can only imagine what, you know, the rest of the country would think. We were all supposed to lose that game. That's how it was. We think we were like 25-point under, underdogs. Damn. And, um, <laughs> yeah, walking into it. And you kind of just felt it in air, something in the air, that this could actually happen uh, before the game. It, it, it felt right. Um, and we generally play better in Madison than we do at home versus the Badgers. So it, it, it all felt really, really good. Um, and then when we, we went, when we went out there and 
you know, I, I'm starting to have a good game. I'm, you know, I'm not missing any tackles. Jonathan Taylor, we're keeping him controlled. We're not really – he's not really getting anything really going. I think he had one one rushing yard um, in the first quarter. I think he had one rush that was over, I don't know, 10 yards, but everything else in that was, you know, kind of constraint. And we uh, we definitely did a really good job um, game planning. We had a lot of young guys out there too that um, – that we had to get their minds right. Hey, this is this is going to be a game unlike anything else. Um, you know, Iowa. You can say anything about Iowa. They're they're the similar pro style offense, but this game they will run the ball until they can't anymore. And it may feel like it may feel like we're actually doing something. First quarter, second quarter, third quarter. It may feel good. We might hold Jonathan Taylor to 150 yards or less than that, uh, 100 yards. Uh, but that fourth quarter, that's what they're betting on. They're betting on the fourth quarter, that we're tired. The D-line's tired. They keep running that outside zone. They keep running this inside um, pull concept. Uh, and the more they run it over and over and over and over again, same type of style. Uh, and they're just betting on you to get tired. And we're telling the young guys this, hey, you're – you're going to get tired, but you got to keep going. And that's uh, that was kind of the mindset we had to give them. But, um, you know, how, and it felt good being the leader of the defense, too, to be able to tell those young guys that and then seeing it all come together. Um, yeah, I mean, it was it was awesome. And then what made it even better was Julian coming in. I mean, that was uh, incredible. I mean, Cashman, our third round linebacker gets hurt and the whole stands are like cheering because he gets kicked out of the game for targeting because now Cashman's out, you know, one of our best players. I, I think he was our best player at the time by far. And Cashman, you know, he's out of the game now, first quarter. And then now it's like, everybody's cheering, but Julian comes in and is like, oh, Julian, you know, it's fine. Uh, he's just, he's a guy who hasn't even played over the past two years. But Minnesotans who, who, you know, have been Minnesota fans for the past four years, they knew that Julian's actually a good fucking player. <laughs> and the first two years, he, he played really well. So, uh, and then right when he got on the field, it was like, he, you know, um, he started taking off. He's getting tackles. He got an interception. I think he had a PBU or something like that. And nobody was running by him. He was breaking. He was blocking. He's getting off blocks, making good tackles. Um, and everybody in the stands was just silent after that because they were just expecting Jonathan Taylor to have a field day. It's not that like Blake Cashman was out. But then Julian coming in in the middle of the, middle of the first quarter, he ended up having 12 tackles. You know, he ended up – playing really well so I think the um the whole the whole game was just really a dream come true I mean it was awesome and uh I think the last thing I'll say about this was I put a um I put a uh, a newspaper after we first lost to Wisconsin I didn't even, I didn't even play that game uh but we lost to Wisconsin and there was a newspaper the next day that says Minnesota fails or Minnesota um uh, Axe goes to Madison or something like that. And I had that newspaper in my bathroom in my freshman year apartment dorm or whatever. And I still don't have, I don't have that anymore, but I had that for the majority of college that I was going to say, Hey, I'm going to beat these guys before I leave here. <laughs> I don't care what it's going to take because yeah, you, you got to remind the, the, the atmosphere of the team uh, from how it felt from player to player it felt like these guys were unbeatable. Like it felt like we've done everything we can try to do. We've had better teams than we've had then, and we just can't beat them. Like there's nothing that we can do. It's, it's impossible. Uh, but, you know, all the former players watching the game, seeing all the videos of us beating them, it was like, it was like fucking Christmas. <laughs> it was awesome. Now I'm going to take it back to the question about your brothers and stuff. How, like, what is your favorite memory of all time of playing? It could be with Jaden as well, or it could just be with Julian. Oh, man. I mean, I would say the Wisconsin game with Julian, but favorite all-time memory? I, I think uh, with all of us would have to be the HF game our junior year of high school. <laughs> That's, yeah, or Julian, uh, I had a really good game. Julian had a, you know, a game – um, 
game-changing and it's one-handed interception. We both had like 20 tackles each, you know. Um, and it was like us versus the Harley Hampton twins, which made it even better <laughs> because it was like the twin bowl. Um, because the Harley Hampton twins were these really good running backs who, you know, me and Julian were the, these really good twin defensive players. And it was like – the, cl the clashing of the twins. Um, and we ended up, they ended up rushing for a lot of yards, but me and Julian also had really good games. And then Jaden had a really good game as well. He ended up scoring the game winning touchdown. Um, and going in, I think we went into double overtime with them that year. And this is HF now. I mean, HF was the, HF would be the equivalent. I wouldn't say that. A HF probably would be the equivalent to Iowa. Um, from from a Minnesota perspective, like Iowa, Iowa and Minnesota versus uh, the Bolenberg HF rivalry, um, but yeah, I mean, no, it was it was a big time win, <sighs> crazy game, but it was it was pretty fun. Yeah, even me and Jake stormed the field after that. <laughs> yeah, we, we all stormed the field to the picture with the trophy. That was the first year with the trophy too. First year with the trophy, you know. I think the athletic director, I'm blanking on his name. Do you guys remember his name? Yeah. That passed. That's the, the trophy's named after him, but I, I can't remember his name. But yeah, anyways, um, first year, you know, and that kind of like solidified the rivalry. Okay, now we have a trophy. Now we have a real rivalry. <laughs> so it was it was pretty cool. All right, so we all watched the Super Bowl, and we saw Antron Winfield throw up the peace sign to Tyreek Hill and everything. So how was it playing next to him at Minnesota? Oh, Antoine's a fool, man. I love Antoine to death. He's, <laughs> he's a really good dude, really good dude. And then if people are just seeing the peace sign and maybe judging him off of that, uh, shame on you because Winfield's actually one of the best men I've ever met in my life. One of the most solid guys I've ever talked to. He'll really, he would really take his clothes off and hand it to a homeless person. Uh, he's that genuine. Uh, he's a really good dude. Uh, but, you know, he's a fool on the field. You, I mean, you turn into a different person on the football field. It's, it's literally that simple. I mean, I personally uh, have done things that, you know, I probably would never do in walking down the street, obviously, but said things, you know, it's a, you're a different person on the field. You're an animal. You, you turn yourself into a gladiator when you, when you got that equipment on. So, uh, the, and Winfield, I, I just really, the only thing I can describe my feeling when I saw that was I'm like, I'm not surprised at all because Winfield has done that or way worse. One time I saw Winfield, Hit a, hit a receiver. I think the receiver was like flying in the air. Like he hit him so hard, he just was in the air for a couple seconds. Gets landed on the ground. Winfield puts his hand out to try to um, to try to help him up, and Winfield puts his hand down to try to help him up. And then the guy reaches his hand out to try to help him up, and then Winfield just takes his hand away <laughs> and walks away. I was like, dude, you're fucking savage, bro. But. <laughs> Um, no, I love Winfield. I mean, he's a really good friend of mine, really, really good dude. Um, but he's, you know, he's a, he's a, he's a man on the field and you see it. I mean, he's the reason why they won the Super Bowl, in my opinion. Uh, he, his presence on defense really changes the whole atmosphere of, uh, of the game. Um, cause you know, when he's out there, you got to account for him and no quarterback, not one has wants to worry about somebody on the other field. They want to be able to drop back, go through a They'll go through the progression, you know, if it's man-to-man -man and they, you know, got their guys they're going to look at to first. But if that ball's in the air for a couple seconds, they don't want to have to worry about one guy, and you do have to worry about Winfield. And, and it was like that when I played in college. It's like that about – it's like that now when uh, he's in the NFL. So I'm really happy for him. Uh, I think he's going to have a Hall of Fame career, and I'm excited to watch it. You got to get him on six blitz, man. <laughs> I'll put it in a good way. You guys run on your, <laughs> on your Myers Leonard shit on the field, <laughs> calling people down. <laughs> Say that again. Hopefully, you guys run on your Myers Leonard shit on the field. <laughs> yeah. Hey. <laughs> it was fun playing with him. Really good dude. You know, we, uh, we, we played really well together. But so, what was the hardest part, in your opinion, of being a Division One athlete? Oh, man. That's. Tough question. I think I think the hard I think the hardest part 
was not physical. Uh, the hardest part was definitely not physical. It was the pressure that you were constantly under. Um, it was always uh, you had to be here at a certain time. You had to be there, and you had to make sure you put on a certain face in front of the coaching staff. You had to make sure you, you know, the coaches liked you to try to, you know, kind of go up in the ranks on the depth chart. Um, man, it was like a, it was it was a crazy it was a crazy experience, and you're under a, a million tons of pressure on a daily basis because you're demanded of so much. You're, you're required to, to do so much um, because the coaches intentionally put it on you like that because they want to know if push comes to shove, if I got two guys and I need to pick a guy over the other, they need to know what is going to put this kid over that kid. And sometimes it's not football. It's not, it's not talent. It's not what, what you put on the field. Sometimes it's just, can I trust you? Can I trust you as a person? Can I trust you as a human? Uh, you know, because if you don't know this playbook or if you're going to do some something stupid that's going to put the team at risk or if you're going to – I need to be able to trust you. Simple as that. That's all a coaching staff thinks about. That's all they, you know, walk into the meeting boards and talk about. Who can I trust out there that's going to win us this football game? It's really that simple. And um, a lot of it – a lot of it goes into school. You know, if your grades aren't right, that's another thing that puts a lot of pressure on you. You got to have your grades right going into each and every um, practice and game every day. If your grades aren't right, they're going to talk to you about it. They're going to pull you aside. They're gonna, or they're going to say it in front of everybody. Hey, you got a D on that freaking test last week. What the hell? And they'll say it in front of everybody, and they'll embarrass you. And they'll, yeah, they have no problem embarrassing you. This guy kicked out of my you. meetings just for bad grades too. They like get yeah, out, they'll get on, on you. <laughs> they'll get on everybody. I, I've seen, I've seen it. I've seen the worst at com. I mean, I've had a coach literally say to my face, uh, "I don't know why I recruited you. I don't I, like you're too slow. You're not fast. You can't jump." You can't read a playbook. I don't. I don't know why I recruited you, <laughs> and it, it's ruthless. It, it hurts your feelings. Um, but like I said, the last thing you need to do, and I say this to both of you, like the last thing you want to do is take anything a coach says to you personally, because it, it'll drive you crazy. Yeah. That's the last thing you want to do. It'll take you. It'll take a lot of years off your life, uh, <laughs> and um, that's that's the worst part about. Uh, college football is taking things personally because a it's an emotional game and b your whole life is wrapped up into this certain situation and it's hard to go in day in and day out and you basically are seen as a you know as a number as somebody who as, as an employee as somebody who's going to provide a product for me and if you don't provide that product for me on the field you are worthless to me and that, that's that's how you feel. And but you take this game so emotionally, um, and you're so emotionally driven in this game. It's impossible not to take it personally. But my all, every day, you know, if a coach says some crap to me, you know, says something that's going to hurt my feelings or something, especially if I'm trying to get, um, or especially if I'm trying to get up in the depth chart, trying to get that starting spot. You can't take it personally. You just got to put your head down and keep working. And that's that's really the best advice I would give to anybody in college right now or about to walk into college. So you came into Minnesota, not at its best time, but you left it on a, on a winning note. And you, the program keeps going up and up. Do you think P.J. Fleck can turn Minnesota into a national contender again year in, year out? I think he can. I think it's on its way to, to be that. Uh, we have to do some things better, uh, in my opinion, uh, looking at this past season. I, th I don't think we can just look at this past season and say, hey, um, it was just a COVID year. No, I mean, there's, that's not an excuse for anybody. Any of the teams they play, they have the same situations. They were under the same um, turbulence that COVID offered. So I, I don't think you can say that. And um, um, I think that this past year, they – ran into a lot of issues like injury, but you run into that every year. So it's like, that's not an excuse either. Um, it, it was tough to watch us have such a great season uh, in 2020 or 2019 when I left. 
uh, and then walking into this past year in 2020 and seeing uh, the guys, younger guys, um, a lot of young guys out there, but it, it was tough to see, you know, that drop off. And you kind of expected it because we did have a lot of NFL guys on that last team and my senior year as well. We had a lot of NFL guys, um, a lot of guys who should have been in the NFL, you know. Um, so uh, guys that you can definitely hang your hat on. And this past year it was like, okay, um, who's going to be those guys to replace them, you know. And they were young. So it's like, okay, it needs more developing. But – We'll see how it goes. I mean, I think we should recruit defense a little bit better. I think we need to, you know, kind of fill in those those NFL guys sl slots. Um, and, you know, offensively, we have to, um, you know, figure out how to replace Bateman, you know. I think Crab is a really good receiver. I think he's going to be on the same level as Bateman. Um, but who, who else are we going to hit, you know. I mean, there's other guys in the repertoire. But um, I'm really looking forward to seeing how they – how they um, kind of fill in those spots. Are uh, you ready to take it to rapid fire questions? All right, now we normally do rapid fire takes, so let's hit you with some rapid fire questions. All right, cool. Let's do it. All right, All right who the first your one being, oh. you can go ahead. <laughs> All right, who was your favorite player growing up? Um, favorite player was, Shoot, oh, man. Uh, Earl Thomas. Sorry, that wasn't fast enough. <laughs> I was I was thinking he was gonna say Honey Badger or something, but <laughs> um, <laughs> yes and no, Honey Badger for sure, Honey Badger. Uh, but if I was looking at an NFL guy, it was uh, it was Earl Thomas. I was studying his film. I was watching it in depth. Um, I wanted to be like him. I wanted to play like him. Of course, Honey Badger is a guy that you know everybody wanted to play like. But if I had a point to a guy that I figured that was my same height, my same skill, skill type of like not even just position, skill, like skill type. How I walk on the field, how I carry myself. I'm a smaller guy, but I'm gonna hit you like a bigger guy. That's how I felt Earl Thomas played. And I'm also gonna make plays that the coach or the quarterback is gonna have to game plan around. That's that was my mindset. So and I watched film um to, to try to be like him. Now, what is the craziest story of you and your twin brother? My bad. Everybody want to call me right now. Hey, um, off, craziest story? <laughs> Non-football related? It don't matter, man. <laughs> uh, I think the craziest story is probably joining, cutting up my thumb, and also uh, hitting me with a croquet mallet and chipping my tooth so I had a chip <laughs> tooth for half my childhood which sucked I still have one but it is a filler um so it sounds like Julian was whooping my ass when we were little but I got my <laughs> into it. <laughs> all right so now a famous debate we got on this show uh is basketball related we always ask settle the, the goat debate Michael Jordan or LeBron James oh you know my answer on this I mean this is not even it's not even it shouldn't even be a conversation <laughs> I'm a I'm a through and through Chicago fan. I'm always going to be, uh, you know, going to lean towards Michael Jordan. Um, I think that Michael Jordan, it doesn't matter. He's got six, you know, walked into every finals appearance and said, I'm going to win it and did it. You know, I can't I can't choose. I can't choose somebody who hasn't done that over somebody who has <laughs> or at least somebody who is over that 500, you know, you know, record of finals, you know, so. So, going into the next question, um, who was the best player you played against? Played against? Yeah. Oh, that's tough. I would say – see, I, I played against guys, but lined up against is different because I've played against Saquon. I've played against uh, Ezekiel Elliott. I've played against uh, Michael Thomas. I've played against, um, you know, Cardell Jones, uh, all those cats. But lining up, okay – me actually being on defense, seeing them face to face, uh, ah, man, that's, that's a tough one. I mean, we're just thinking about. I, I would say, um, oh man, oh yeah, uh, I would say Noah Fant. Noah Fant was probably 
one of the toughest tight ends. And usually I'm a slower guy, but I, I felt very comfortable covering tight ends. He was a tight end. I did not feel comfortable covering at all. He ran at like a 4.5 in the 40. Uh, and at his size is very, very dangerous. I think he's a guy that's in the NFL now who isn't really jumping off the charts. Uh, but give him some time. Let him develop a little bit. Let him, like, stop fumbling and stop, you know, dropping passes and stuff like that. Let him block, learn how to block a little bit more. I think he's going to be very dangerous. I'm kind of roasting uh, him. <laughs> <laughs> I'm critical. You know I mean? I'm, I'm telling you about his play style. He had a problem. That's why he got drafted less than um, the other guy. Um, Hawkinson, right? Yeah. Hawkinson. Um, that's why he got drafted less because he couldn't he couldn't block as good as him. And you need to be able to block in the NFL if you're a tight end. But a guy that, you know, who I can look to as – you know, hey, if I'm lining up against them, this is going to be tough. Uh, and I knew that going against – Fumagalli was also really good at tight end. I thought he was very, very um, – the way he used his body as a tight end, it was very hard to cover. Like, if you were covering him like, you know, like glue and the ball's in the air, more than likely he was going to come down with it because of the way he used his body at tight end. And I think a lot of guys don't know how to do that, and that's what separates the good from the great. Um, but Hawk, uh, um, Fant was really good. And then Jonathan Taylor. I think Jonathan Taylor was um, – he was literally a horse running the football. Like, once he was started to go, this is literally imagine trying to tackle a horse going full speed. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's not, it's not going to work. Uh, so, I mean, that's kind of how uh, I saw it going into Wisconsin games. I saw I was telling the younger guys, like, hey – if we can keep this guy within five yards of us, if we can keep him from that five five yard to five yard from the line of scrimmage to the to the linebacker uh, position line, if we can just keep him in front of us, we're fine. But once he gets going, he's very very hard to beat, and uh, I can't say the same about a lot of running backs. I, I can. Rodney Smith was also a, he played with me. He was also a guy that ran like a, an absolute horse. Once he got going, he was very hard to bring down. But guys in the Big Ten, I mean, I mean there are other guys like I said that were, you know, kind of close to that. But um, I, I, I had never seen a player run run the way that he has in person. Now you play safety, uh, your whole like from Pop Warner on. So who would you say is the greatest safety of all time? Uh, greatest safety of all time? Shoot. I'd say, I mean, it's it's a topic either either Ed Reed or, or Troy Palomalo. I mean, that's a that's a other yeah, debate no that some yeah, some yeah. people can have. But I think safety is just a, it's a, a position that um kind of can fit any mold. Like if you look at Cam Chancellor, I would say he's the hardest hitting safety of all time. Right. If you look at um, Ed Reed, I think he he's probably the most calculated. He's probably the most guy, uh, guy that can diagnose a play fast enough and understand what the offensive concept is and put him himself in good positions to make plays. I think Troy Polamalu was just an absolute ball hawk. The ball found him. Anywhere he went, the ball found him. And, and uh, guys like that are very, very valuable. Um, guys who just the ball finds. For some reason, nobody can, nobody can say this or that. The ball is going to find him wherever he's at. Um, and so when you look at qualities like that and you add them all together, it's tough. It's tough to be able to say who's, who's better. But I'd say it's either Ed Reed or, or um, Troy Palomalo. Ah, there's been some great answers to this question. Let's see if you can top them. You have three dinner guests, dead or alive. Who are you choosing? Oh, man. Well, shoot. Dead or alive? Um, I'd, say I'd probably say uh, Barack Obama, Martin Luther King, <laughs> um, and shoot. Jesus Christ. <laughs> but I'm serious. Now. I, I, would, I would like to sit down with all three of those people. And, you know, I'm very spiritual. I'm very, you know, religious. Um, 
And, you know, I read my Bible day in and day out. And, you know, obviously that'd be a good person to sit down with. Uh, and then Martin Luther King, his impact on the world and on, you know, our American society has just been invaluable. And then Barack Obama, Barack Obama just seems like a cool person to hang with. Actually, let me add a fourth person, probably Dave Chappelle. <laughs> Yeah. Now we're talking. <laughs> <laughs> Let me add one more person to that because uh, to... <laughs> well, yeah. yeah, for sure, Dave Chappelle. He's my favorite comedian. So, you know, if I can have those four, it'd be great. It's interesting that you mentioned two of those names. Stay tuned, though. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> all right so for the last question we ask every guest uh you, we've asked you multiple times this question is <laughs> response to you every time but now on a record in the movie cars do they, do they have life insurance or car insurance let's hear your final answer they have car insurance <laughs> <laughs> now you're chasing clout <laughs> i'm not chasing anything i'm just telling you like it is it's life insurance <laughs> or it's car insurance i'm gonna tell you why because they can get life insurance. I mean, anywhere else. Yeah. I mean, you can get you can get car insurance. You can get health insurance. You can get a ton of different insurance. But they're gonna need they're gonna need that that health insurance. I would relate it to health insurance. You know what I mean? That's like, <laughs> hey, how you gonna how you gonna keep yourself a lot? Keep yourself good. Keep yourself you know right. Life insurance is something that's totally different. I mean, you know, they they would have to purchase life insurance. It's totally different. <laughs> You come on our show and you add an answer to the question. Not one time, but twice. <laughs> you go, you go oh, I'm going to add four people. Oh, I'm going to go with health insurance. Come on. <laughs> it's, it's, the, it's the truth. I mean, what do you want me to say? <laughs> that, that is definitely one we will never hear again. I don't think everybody is. <laughs> it's, it's the same thing as health insurance. So, I mean, I'm picking car insurance. It's really that simple. It makes sense, man. I was, I was thinking the same thing, actually. But uh, so that's all we got for you today. We appreciate you for coming on um, again. Um, and a great interview, man. Appreciate you again. Yeah, no doubt, man. Thanks for having me. I appreciate the time. And, uh, you know, anytime you guys, you know, want to talk football, I need some, you know, advice, let me know. All right, we got you. Appreciate it again. All right, sounds good. All right, we're back. Hope you guys enjoy the interview. We have more interviews coming up. Got a twin brother, Julian Huff, next week. And then we'll yes, sir. do some more interviews in. But did this man actually just say health insurance? The, the last couple questions, he created his own answers. Oh, he created his own questions. Like, we, like we, he giving the interview to us. <laughs> it, was, it was an either or. This man said health insurance. But we're not going to get into this. <laughs> Come on, man. What? Imagine taking a test and there's two answers. True or false? Nah, it's both. <laughs> <laughs> Or creating your own answer for that shit. It's like a choose your own adventure book, but it's like you, you don't choose either or. You just make your own make your own book. It's like you just going off topic there. Might as well just take a new class or something. <laughs> but now let's get into some sports talk. Uh, we saw a lot of trades go down in the NBA. Uh, Big today. day today. Trade deadline. Um, we, we expected a lot, but we didn't expect this many. Just some like role players getting traded and stuff. It was – if you had Spanish notifications or Woj notifications, you, you heard some bombs today on Twitter. <laughs> what was your initial reaction to when the Bulls traded for a uh, made a big move? A Chicago sports team finally making the big move. It's been a while. Vucevic, man. I was not expecting out of all the Magic players to get traded, I was not expecting him. Because Magic, they were coming out saying, oh, we want a bunch of stuff for, you know, Vucevic. But they took Otto Porter and Wendell Carter Jr. <laughs> And two picks that, like, the Bulls, like, now the Bulls are going to be competitive with two All-Stars. So, hey, like, those it doesn't matter to us anymore. Nah, nah, it doesn't. <laughs> so, like, this, and it was really surprising, like, those trades with the Magic, back-to-back. -back. Evan Fournay went to the Celtics, right? Like, 30 minutes later, Aaron Gordon to the Nuggets. Like, damn, they, they really trying to clean house, basically. And you, and you remember when the uh, NBA started this year, the Magic were, like, one of the best teams in the league. And then Marco yeah. Fultz went down and Cole Anthony just didn't pan out to what he was supposed to be this year. So it was hey, just – Who is their GM, bro? He he, he's trying to be like he – try, he's trying to be like Sam Presti, but he's a version of, oh, we got food at home type Sam Presti. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, I don't know what he's doing, man. What, what, what did he major in college? 
I can go to any kind of major. So I can get that same major, go be the GM of the Orlando Magic. If all I'm saying is if I'm playing 2K and I'm going to my GM, I'm not trading their best player for Wendell Carter Jr. I've been saying this whole time, this man is trash. He can't guard nobody. He can't even stay healthy. You know, Otto Porter not good. He already he making twenty two million a year, aging another year every every year. Uh, it's just the Bulls hit a finesse on the on the match. I can't explain it, bro. And I, that, like they really finessed him for real. <laughs> and we got uh, Alfred Camino, right? Yeah. So we got him too coming off the bench, and then we got uh, Nikola. Uh, what's what's the, how do you say his last name? Nikola Vucevic. I keep thinking Nikola Mirotic. I'm like, this. he was a bum for us. Three, wait, what was the, What was Stacey King's three cola? <laughs> <laughs> they were talking about uh, this EuroLeague MVP coming up. Like, hey, still barely getting minutes. He, he, whenever he come in, he instantly shoot a three. I swear, bro. He was cold. He had that thick-ass beard, too. He was, yeah, he was, he was in cold. The corner. He was cold for, like, three games. And after that, he ice Bro, cold. bro. But I was watching a uh, part of the interruption, right? Michael Wilbon said that the last time the Bulls had a center that averaged 24 a game was like 30 years ago. Yeah, I don't even think Joe King Noah averaged that much. He was an all-star, but he didn't average, you know, 24 a game. <laughs> Joe, uh, Joe King Noah was just guarding people, getting their rebounds, just passing it out. He wasn't looking to score. <laughs> he threw that. <laughs> Got to respect the, the throw. Sticky, sticky 13. <laughs> All right, but there are some players that didn't get shipped. Uh, surprisingly, all the, I've never seen so many more Photoshops than Lonzo Ball. I swear. Lonzo Ball is the Photoshop for every team. Even the Dude. Sacramento Kings. I don't know how, but I saw one today, and I was like, this is something new. I've never seen a player even, even Photoshop on Sacramento Kings. When I saw it on Lonzo Ball, I was dead. But Lonzo Ball didn't get traded. Kyle Lowry didn't get traded. Some big-time names didn't get traded while Aaron Gordon's getting traded. Kyle Lowry and his cake stayed in Toronto, man. <laughs> but, like, the crazy thing is, like, a lot of people are like, where did all this Lonzo Ball hype come from? <laughs> Everybody was looked- fresh early this year. They're like, hey, now, now, now let me get him. It's like, right. we were just roasting. It's like the Porzingis thing. They were roasting him on draft day, and then, oh, he's good. Let me get him. Nah, it don't work it's like just that. just because he made more threes than Trey Young this year, man. <laughs> yeah, it don't, it, don't, it don't really work like that, man. But, nah. Hey, and that's crazy that he made more threes than Trey Young, though. That's a, is. that's a crazy stat, but Lonzo Ball is, is crazy to me, man. He, he just – He's having a career year, too. So, I think – I mean, I don't, it wouldn't have made sense to me for the Pelicans to trade him. I mean, he's like young, him and uh, uh, Zion. You keep that uh, connection together. The lo- they could be like Lob City, you know, the Clippers. I just don't think he's going to stay, though, with the Pelicans. Yeah. So, I don't know why they kept him. There's yeah, nothing out of him. I would have traded him. Um, hey, nobody's trying to stay in in New in, in New Orleans, bro. Yeah, like, it did. It's, it's not, not really a big market for bat, especially for basketball. I mean, if you ain't playing football there, I mean, you know, t- look, LSU, LSU, <laughs> LSU is a bigger fan base than New Orleans Pelicans. I'm not watching the game unless you know, you know, Zion, you know. But, but all right, who was uh, who, who was your uh, what? When Zion's debut and they broke the record? Oh, yeah. It's like there, there was a lot of hype around him on the Pelicans, but yeah, who, who do you think was your biggest winner for the uh, trades? Trade deadline? Yeah. Uh, I mean, besides the Bulls, because the Bulls were huge. I think the Clippers getting Rajon Rondo. Oh, yeah. I but think they gave was... up Lemon Pepper Lou. <laughs> <laughs> Lou William. You know, he, he about to go to the clubs in Atlanta, man. But Every day after games, he just in there before games. <laughs> but uh, I think it's a great ad for Rondo. People don't realize what Rondo brings to the team defensively. Playoff Rondo. He doesn't have to score. He, he can just pass, make open times, and then he can he can do the fake behind the pass layup. I mean, it's Rondo. Yeah. How could you hate on Rondo? But I think the Clippers are the biggest. Besides- That's what the Clippers are missing, too. A leader. They don't have a, nobody that's a leader. I mean, Pat Bev, but, you know, nobody really be listening to Pat Bev. I wouldn't listen to him. Hey, but <laughs> how, about, how about the Nuggets, though? Oof. JaVale McGee off the bench. Aaron Gordon. They have, like, one of the best – they have one of the best, like, first eight. You know what I mean? Paul so, Millsap. So, who is – who's going to start? Paul Millsap, Aaron Gordon. It's got to be Aaron Gordon, right? I'm, I'm starting Aaron Gordon. Paul Millsap, he's a little washed now, man. He's he makes, old he makes like top 10 money in the league. It's like, how? 
But, uh, Atlanta Hawk days, bro. <laughs> if uh, Jamal Murray get back to that bubble, uh, Jamal Murray, then uh, watch out. But Nuggets are just a mediocre team. Everyone's watch out for them this year. Watch out for them. They're the they're the Las Vegas Raiders of the NBA. I think that's a fair. I mean, hey, but like, and the Lakers are down right now, so they can they can move up in the standings a little. Are the Lakers even gonna make that's the playoffs? Okay. Oh, <laughs> yeah, LeBron James, he's going to be out for a month. <laughs> Are the Lakers going to make the playoffs? You know, they, they haven't been looking good. They got blown out the other day. They literally were so desperate for the Twitter, they put a picture of Kyle Kuzma on the, on the scoreboard thing. Like, oh, my goodness. Who's, this, who's the third best player in the Lakers? Is it, is it Kuzma? Schroeder, maybe? I don't know. I think well, I, I mean, I you know, it's bad when Jared Dudley be getting minutes. <laughs> yeah, he's all us. He getting minutes. He, he, he knows. Hey, man, let, let's let's uh, shy away from the NBA, though. Let's get into some NCAA hoops. Most upsets ever in a, a tournament. You actually got a good bracket, though. What I saw, uh, you, you got a, a decent bracket. You still got three or the four of the Final Four teams, right? Nah, because uh, I had Illinois and Texas in. Well, it depends because I made like six different brackets. So yeah, that's what I'm saying. I only make one because I don't want to get mad when my other bracket does better, but I ain't put in anything, so I just make one. Um, so we, we're from Illinois, and so we're rooting on for Loyola Chicago. Do you think Sister Gene, we trust. Sister Gene, Cameron Crutwig, uh, I mean, <laughs> you know him, him with the mustache. Uh, he he looked like he's 37 uh, <laughs> in the local rec league. But do you think they can make, make another Final Four run? I, I, look at, if you look at their bracket, they play Oregon State next. Don't sleep on the Beavers, man. I'm sleeping. <laughs> you hey, you low-key, like, their first week, you had them as an upset, bro. I remember we were talking about it. and But, like, I don't know. They could, like, they can uh, hit Houston. I don't know. It depends really on, you know, that side of the bracket. But I don't know, man. It's tough. Like, if you, if you look at their, uh, their region left, Oregon State, Houston, and Syracuse. So, Syracuse, you know, they play in the zone. They, Buddy, Bo Buddy Bo Buddy Boheim or whatever it is. <laughs> bro, you throwing me off. What's the, what's the coach saying? Jim? Oh, man. I'm Jim drawing Bo a Boheim? You, man, hey, we, we you can't pronounce, you can't pronounce nothing. The show. <laughs> you can't pronounce nothing, man. It's not <laughs> – God. Man, you throwing me off, man. But uh, Bohem. Man. Man, I, whatever, whatever. Syracuse, you know they're running the zone. Um, I'm gonna be pissed after watching this. I, I know I know the name of the coach, but uh Houston, they don't play nobody, but they blow teams out though. That's the thing. Uh, yeah. So Quentin Grimes is a good player, but I mean I got Houston in my final four now. Because coming out, like, I like them a lot more than Loyola and Syracuse. But it's – I mean, anything could happen in this tournament. Freaking Oral yeah. Roberts. I never heard of their ass. And they in in the 16 right now. So, I mean – They got some dogs. They got some dogs. I know. Like, they have, like – they have some people that can get a bucket. <laughs> Multiple people. Ain't nobody know where Oral Roberts is. But, hey, they've been going cool. <laughs> hey, but who did, so you know your final four busted with Texas, Chaka Smart letting you down, horns down, I'm gonna say. Um, but what is your new final four? You know, the ESPN second chance. Who would you have in your your final four now? All right, I kept I have the still two teams left that are in my final four originally. I have Baylor and Gonzaga. If Gonzaga's not in your final four, Larry, you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Basketball powerhouse. Like I don't, I don't see anybody beating them. I don't know. And then I have Houston and Michigan. I like what Michigan's doing. They have momentum from the LSU game. Isaiah Livers is out, but you know they have a guy named Brown that's stepping up big in those shoes. So I like what Jawan Howard's doing. Fab hey, five. They are holding on to the Big Ten, man. Best conference. Hey, Syracuse coach Jim Beheim. That's what Beheim. I'm talking about. What I'm talking about. It, just, it does not look like how it's spelled. No. Jim Beheim. Let's go. All right. So uh, my final four does not have Jim Beheim. It has Loyola. It has Baylor. No, no, no. Scratch that. Loyola. You don't have Baylor? I do not have Baylor. I was going to put Baylor in mine, but then I had, I still have Arkansas in my final four with my original bracket, so I'm just going to stick with them. Uh, I got Eric Musselman, the must-bust baby. 
I'm sticking with it. Uh, Gonzaga, you know me. Jalen Suggs, Drew Timmy, Corey Kispert, big three, getting it done. And then my last team, I'm not going to go Michigan in the final five, fab five. I got them losing on Saturday to Florida State. And I have Florida State. Best, best Florida State team ever. You know, they got MJ and Pippen. Uh, so, no, no, MJ and Scotty on that team. Scotty Barnes, of course. Um, so I'm going to go with those four, uh, four seed, uh, eight seed, and then the three seed and the one seed. I like it. I mean, I was like, I was a little hesitant on Florida State Michigan game, but. Yeah, I feel like that's a know. big game this weekend. It is. I think the blowout is going to be Alabama UCLA. I don't see UCLA keeping it close. I mean, they don't have Lonzo anymore. No. <laughs> Lonzo was a dog, man. I'm, I'm not even going to cap. All right, NFL free agency. There's still some people left out there. You know, you got the Richard Sharmans, Davion Clowney. Who are you most surprised with that is not signed yet? It's tough. I mean, so Davion Clowney's probably going to get picked up by the Browns soon. He took a beating there. But I don't know. Like, there's some big names like Antonio Brown, Sammy Watkins, like Richard Sherman. I thought he would be by the arm of the Jets sooner, you know what I mean? But – there's some good guys out right now. So I don't know. I mean, the hey, Antonio, the Ravens need to be looking at anybody that play receiver. Like, if I'm the Ravens, I'm picking up receivers. I don't know how they haven't signed one yet. Like, Kenny Galladay was out there. Uh, Sammy Watkins is uh, took yeah, a meeting yeah, over there. there. So that's good for them. Corey Davis. No, we got sources. <laughs> no, we, got a, we got an inside sources. But um, Antonio Brown, I think he's going to stay with the Bucks. I feel like that's the best – for him, he might go to Seattle, man. You heard that? Like Russell's trying to get him to come. Russell's trying to get him to come, but the, the front office doesn't like Russell Wilson, enough. so you know they're not <laughs> in the offensive line protection. But um, you know, Clowney on the Browns—that's the rumor. The Browns have been last offseason; they got all offense. Now this offseason, they got all defense. So I would look out for the Browns, man. But hey, the crazy thing is, you think they keep Beckham this year? I think they should. Yeah. I don't know. Hey, the Baker start having a down year again. They're going to be blaming yeah. Beckham. Yeah, if they start having a down year, I think they could trade him. But, hey, hey, it's going to be fun to see where everybody lands. But most imp- who do you think is the most improved team from free agency then with all the players? Nah, so? I would say the Giants. Nah, because they're coming off a year where they had a good in- good season. Like, they put on a good show without Zaquan Barkley. Now they're getting him back healthy. Now you get go out and get a receiver, Kenny Galladay, to pair with Slayton, if he Shepard. Stays healthy though. Yeah, if he stays healthy, that's a good point. But and then you get Kyle Rudolph, and then Jackson from the Titans. And their secondary is looking a little, looking a little nasty. And then Joe Judge already had a defense that was playing great last year. So I mean, I think you put in more help with the secondary, and then you know get some help in the draft. I think this is going to be the best year Daniel Jones has had. And I got the bold prediction, Giants win in the NFC East. I think that's a – I don't think that's a bold prediction anymore at this point because I think I, I think the Giants should win at least 10 games. Yeah. I see that East, NFL East is dog, like, crap. Like we said, like, it, it's known. The Washington football team is good. Eagles, they're – down bad for real. I would love to see the Giants go crazy, but the defense is yeah. bad. New coaches have bad. Um, mm-hmm. Who's the Cowboys? I, you know what you're getting with the Cowboys. You're there. Defensively, they're not going to be back good. Two million a year, but it's like their defense is still bad. Their defense was one of the worst uh, in the league last year. Before Mike McCarthy started smashing watermelons before games. Uh, get, Gallagher, oh! <laughs> get the Giants, you get Saquon back. I, I was a little weary on the uh, Kenny Galladay tr- uh, signing. Uh-huh. It was seventy-two million over four. That's a lot of money for a receiver does yeah, status. But if he does, that's good. You know, Evan Ingram, if he limits his drops, he had a lot of drops, and they still have the, the last year. They still have the eleventh pick. Jeez. So they can do a lot. They can go a lot with that. They can go DB. They can even go receiver at that point. If maybe if Waddle falls falls in them, maybe if they trade back, you know. I mean, they can go offensive line even, defensive yeah. line. Joe Judge. 
I mean, you can get somebody following them. Like, like last year when the Cardinals, they had Isaiah Simmons following them. You know, everyone kept talking about Isaiah Simmons top five, and then he fell out top five, and Cardinals got him at eight. So anything could happen for the Giants. I expect them to be the NFC East. Yeah, I think they're going to have a good year. That, I mean, I think – and they got Kyle Rudolph, too, so they can run the – you know, I they got like two tight ends. So that, that shit gonna be nice, bro. You know, I just referred to the Browns being good. Um, Patriots obviously made good. The, I'm I'm going with the Dolphins. Signing the Will, Dolphins. Signing Will Fuller has been a great addition. Someone to take the top off, and they still had the third pick. And I mean, if they could get a James Conner still out there, they could still get a running back. I mean, look what look what these running backs have signed for. Derek Mark Henry, two million. Philip Lindsay, they two. Have two picks in the first round, don't they? They yeah, yeah. They have number three, and then they have I'm gonna say twenty fifth. You know how the running backs do in the draft too? They can get Najee Harris shit too. Najee Harris twenty fifth. Travis Etienne twenty fifth. I mean, anything can happen. But three, they can go. You know, Devontae Smith, Jamar Chase, Penny Penny Sewell. Get the best player available, Kyle Pitts. <laughs> they could get Kyle Pitts, though. Like, I mean, we're, you know, they got Mike McGlinchey, though. But, I mean, move Mike Kyle Pitts out. He's like a Jimmy Graham kind of player. Uh, yeah. Dolphins can look scary, man. But that division is getting better and better, especially if the Jets go out there assigning. Yeah, three teams in the playoffs, bro. And then Cam, healthy Cam Newton. Bills are the Bills. I am. <laughs> all right, so that's all we got for the show. What you got for closing remarks, though? My boy AK was in in the meetings, man. Getting getting all the moves done, bro. Nikola Vucevic. If you would have told me that would happen, I would have been like, what? The, what? The? I would have been like, how? They pulled it off. Otto Porter, Wendell Carter, and then you get Daniel Tice from the Celtics, a good big man. I, I like what the Bulls are gonna do. I think. Hey, bold prediction. Second round. The Bulls are in the second round. I can see it. Anything is possible. I can see it, man. <laughs> A closing remark, it's got to be Eloy Jimenez, uh, White Sox left fielder. He went up Good for boy. a ball and he hit the fence, and now he's out five to six months. <laughs> supposed to be one of the best players on the White Sox this year. It's supposed to be a big year for him, big leap for him, but uh, nothing but pain today, man. Phone on do not disturb all day. I was, I was feeling it today, man. It's a sad day. <laughs> Hopefully we get him back for the playoffs, but – very, very sad day. All right, man. What you got for song of the week, though? Peaches by Justin Bieber. Yes, sir. It's been a good song. I like I like the tempo. It's it's definitely gonna be a song that in the summer, you know, when everything's open up, you're gonna be playing that shit with the with the with the car with the window down, bro. That's a vibe. All right, my I got two songs of the week actually. I'm throwing I'm throwing my two cents in. I'm going going. Right, let's see what you got. Going up by CJ. Uh huh. Good song, good song. And I got Hellcats and Tomahawk, or Hellcats and Trackhawks by Only the Family and Lil Dirt. <laughs> Only the Family and Lil Dirt, man. Can't go wrong with the voice of the streets. OTF! Uh, <laughs> but, yeah, that's all we got for you guys today. Uh, if, hey, if you guys know anybody that wants to come on the show, hit us up, Hit the help out the boys, get some interviews. Uh, we should got some – hopefully we get some good more interviews coming up soon. Um, you know, we finally had a basketball guest. Uh, so hopefully we can get some more diversity in sports. Maybe even <laughs> analyst soon. I, you know, anything's possible. Um, but appreciate the support coming up from coming from you guys. Now look at YouTube channel growing and all this and that. Really appreciate you guys. Uh, you know, keep down those episodes. We're about to hit 500 episode uh, episode downloads on Apple Podcast, Spotify, um, in less than four months. So. <laughs> Really appreciate it, you guys. Really, you know, we didn't expect to come this far already. So it's it's been good to see where this is going. And you got anything else? Hey, remember, professional players, anybody, you see a DM from Six Man Blitz, check it in your spam, respond. All it takes is simple. We'll get you on the interview. Hey. Who knows? We got a lot of connections, man. We'll get you to go into the next place. We can get you endorsements, anything. Yeah. <laughs> we'll with you. We're talking to you, man. But um, that's all we got for you guys today. Um, you know, follow us on social media again at Six Man Blitz. Uh, we're on everything. Uh, keep downloading those episodes. Apple, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube. 
And that's all we got for you guys. See you guys next week. Peace. Yes, sir.